You're listening to Whiskey Tango Foxtrot with your host, Maddie Conrad. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for tuning in this week again to Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. We are in season two, and I am really excited to be sharing a few really interesting conversations with some amazing people with you. Now, this is my very first time uh, recording a podcast in isolation because of the quarantine from COVID-19. Uh, it's, it's made us change up some of the technology. This is our first podcast by Zoom. This is the first thing that we're actually having a video podcast. And I'm really excited to be able to do this at a distance now because this is also our very first podcast where I have not been sitting directly across from the person that I'm interviewing. So we're truly living in the future now. We are, we're catching up technology-wise, which opens up an entire new avenue uh, for me to talk to some of the people that I don't run into very often. And one of the people who I'm really excited to introduce you to is my friend, Mark Jason Salofa. Mark Jason is an absolute OG uh, for barbering. He is, he's probably one of my favorite original barbers. I met Mark Jason a number of years ago uh, before Instagram was a thing. I think we made friends on Facebook, uh, that, that platform that you're parents all used to spy on you yeah we we were actually friends back then and we ended up making friends I invited him to come up and do a guest spot in my brand new barber shop which is called Victory Barber and Brand like almost 10 years ago now and right out of the gate we had become incredibly close friends there is few people in this industry that I respect uh, their opinion more. I respect the way they carry themselves more and the way that they they don't just talk the talk but walk the walk Mark Jason Salofa is an absolute gentleman, and I'm excited to welcome to the podcast today. We're going to talk about a lot of imperative things, especially during this, I think, f- struggle that we're all going through with the COVID lockdown. So, Mark Jason Salofa, welcome to our podcast. Aloha, and thank you. Uh, I don't know how much I got to send in the, in the mail. I know we're doing everything viral now. So do I send you like a Venmo for that nice introduction, bro, or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't do physical okay, mail well, anymore, okay? Physical yeah, mail well. is done. We're living in Gattaca world now, and so, Ooh, yeah, all that, all that craziness. How are you holding up, my man? How are you holding I'm up? Great. I'm great. I'm great, man. I, uh, maybe I'm one of the few that feels like uh, I'm just enjoying it. It's like a vacation, you know? You know, we're still early in this thing. It's only about uh, two to three, two to three weeks deep. And I think that there's still a few people that are feeling that. And you know what? That's okay to feel. I mean, some of us needed a breath, you know, and I don't mean that to diminish anybody that's struggling this early on, but, but some of us needed a breath. There was, it was really becoming a treadmill to keep up on, wasn't it? Yeah. It's, um, you know, you, how we're talking about how doing this, uh, this face-to-face uh, through Zoom now, the technology of sorts, you know. Um, you're right. This is going to change how everybody in our industry looks at the industry now. It's going to change how people view how they've done business in the past up to this point, and it's yeah. going to change, and hopefully it should change how they view they're going to do smarter business going forward. Now, um, that's a very interesting thing to talk to you about, because you pride yourself on being the epitome of the traditional barber, in which, I mean, I, just for reference for those people listening, um, Mark Jason Salofa started a small shop in, uh, in Berkeley, California, uh, with just one share, just one share in himself, and he's built it now into three shops, uh, and and a, an amazing team of barbers, and he built it on the back of providing extraordinary customer service, just very solid, solid customer service. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but one of the things that's been really special for me is to be able to come and do guest spots at your shop. I've often referred to it as like my spiritual home of barbering, if there is one, you know, a, a place where I go to get my head on straight uh, whenever all the rest of this starts becoming kind of big. So I really want to talk to you about um, this you know, momentum of all this modern technology invading on kind of traditional barbering. So why don't you just tell everybody a little bit about how you got started and, and give me a little bit of the backstory of Mark Jason Salofa. Yeah, just, uh, just on a, uh, the Cliff Notes version of it. Um, you know, I worked in uh, uh, banking and finance, in the mortgage industry, insurance for about 17 years. And I think it's afforded me this sort of comfort that I'm in now because I was in that recession. I got laid off in that recession of 2008, right? So I got hit at that time, like most did. But after working 17 years for other people, I had, at 38 years old, I had nothing to show for it. I had no savings account. I was, uh, I had good credit, but everything was going to credit cards. I was renting a room, uh, nothing. I had no safety net. If I didn't get the the... If I didn't get the uh, the severance check that I got, 
I don't know what I would have done, man. So, you know, I took that, I took that as an opportunity to say like, maybe it's time for me to do something different. But maybe this is that, that this is opportunity knocking at my front door to say like, you, well, you always said, if I could do something different, if I could do something different, like now is your opportunity. All right, here's a little severance check. You got nothing to lose. So that's when I went into what I thought was originally a barber school that ended up being a cosmetology school. Got How me, is that? Got How me, is that? Got me, man. Got I, I was one of those kids that started in cosmetology school too. How was that? With uh, did it meet expectations going in? No, so I so I was so eager to start. Like I didn't do my due diligence. Right? I didn't see what the difference between the licenses were. So I thought, okay, go online, look, and whatever the best school that you can afford with your unemployment and the grants, like just go for it. So I ended up at a Paul Mitchell school, right? And I, when I remember in my orientation, I was like, well, I want to become a barber. That, that's, that's my goal. They're like, yeah, we'll teach you all that. Or I said, okay. And I was like, okay, like, just sign. Sign here. And when I sign here, boom. Make sure you know I'm in there. I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> and then they got you doing braiding and perms yeah, right? and rollers. Like, well, <laughs> I, like, well, I was kind of cool going through the first part until it got to the color wheel, man. And then I got lost. I said, like, neutralize this with that. I'm like, I, I'm now. I saw oh. I saw Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs run by. Then I saw a bad <laughs> thing. It was. Uh, but they, but I, I, you I, made I, your I, way I, out. You made it yeah, through. Yeah, I, I figured like I'm there, so why not learn the skills that I could learn here, and then do the crossover program, which I realized was available. Mm -hmm. And I think that route, while it was the longer way, it taught me a lot about the business side of things in the industry. You know, I got to do some. You know, as a as a as a future professional, got to go on stage at a hair show with a lot of the big folks. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from which was big for Stephanie Kachelski and Takashi and Chromie. Yeah. As a student, you know, I was on stage at a hair show, just kind of holding color bowls in the back, just like, just yeah, like, oh, that's cool. You know, um, so when I went into the barbering side, yeah, I, I was really able to channel it and focus on that. Well, that's a that's a thing that I think. And sheer yeah. work and stuff, you know. I think that's a thing that um, I, I universally now is being celebrated. At first, it wasn't being celebrated very much. The idea of being, uh, you know, having a cosmetology background almost yeah. eroded your credibility as a barber. But now uh, the landscape has shifted so that it's, in fact, I think lending uh, credibility is as, you know, the expectations for styles right. uh, from barbershops start to change. Have you noticed that? Uh, I have um, tremendously. And, you know, it's funny because I'll have. Uh, like Al, you know, Al, my right hand, dude, Al. You know. Al, is, Al is a beauty, man. Al is, Al is one of the finest gentlemen so uh, I've met in a long time. Yeah, so he always, in the beginning days, felt because he felt the pressure of having to live up to the fact that I went to a cosmetology school first and then the barber school second. Hmm. And so I have to keep reminding him almost defensively as if I was taking offense, like, no, I am a barber first and then I have a cosmetology license. It just hmm. happened that the route I went it was by my own fault and my own lack of due diligence. I ended up going here because they said it was this minimum that way. Where the heart of me was, I wanted to go here. The route that I took was better for me than if I had just gone to barber school because it allowed me a more open view of hair in general. While I don't do women's hair, except for my daughter's hair, Jordan, I'll cut her hair. But I, you know, since since beauty school, I've never colored hair. I don't do. Yeah. I just do, very do you but do you recommend? It's given me better. Do you recommend that route to people? I mean, is it, do you recommend one over the other? You know, now over the years, I've, got, I've been asked a lot whether it's worth doing the crossover program. Mm -hmm. And I've been honest to tell uh, licensed cosmetologists, like, unless you plan on doing straight razor shave, don't go. Just yeah. do more hair, right? Just uh, practice more hair, get more people in your chair. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, I think there was a point where the crossover thing was, well, while, while I can say I got two licenses now, right? Yeah. Well, I'm as badass now. I got this and I got this. But then you go to the barbershop, you're just doing men's hair, but you, you, you had no desire to, to use straight razor. Um, but that's what defines us. That's what separates the two trades, right? So yeah. unless your heart is in it to do those things, um, don't just go learn how to do more hair by practicing more. So let's jump forward past school. Let's look yeah. into uh, when you opened your shop. What, yeah. what was that? What was that like? Because you were very green. Uh, I mean, you, you went yeah. to work for uh, you went to work uh, firstly in a shop. You didn't open a shop right out of school. You worked yeah. for another barber. Yep, yeah. I went to uh, Barber Dan. Barber Dan uh, Dan Pell, who to date has been a barber for fifty two years. I started with him as my first shop. Very green, no behind the chair experience. I had already done some work for American Crew. 
And in my mind, I was like, as a young barber, like, oh, I know how to do something. <laughs> and then I went into, and Barber Dan's is an old school traditional shop, as traditional as they could have been back in 1950, 40, 60. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that experience of tough love, you know, like that was like going through an old school apprenticeship through him. Mm -hmm. Because everything I did was, it wasn't even, it wasn't even like critiqued. It wasn't even like, you know, like today it's like, well, I, like, I see what you did there, but let's try this. It was just straight up as garbage. You know, <laughs> and come, and that wasn't come even, smack the comb out of your yeah, hand. And that nope. wasn't even a side conversation, man. That was in a crowded shop of people. <laughs> yeah, there, man. Yeah, yeah, it's a trial by fire with those old guys, and I love and that, I, though. You know, I love I that. Change that, right? That's the part where I, I take pride in my traditional as a traditional part because I went through that. I went yeah. through an apprenticeship with a guy that's been at it longer than I've been alive. Almost, See, you know? I, I, ad I advocate for apprenticeship over uh, additional courses any day. You know what I mean? I, I think immersing yourself in a situation where you're going to be able to go and, and take additional courses from people are, is great. Uh, multiple licenses, great. Yeah. But you're never going to get the kind of refinement you're going to get out of an apprenticeship. Yeah. yeah. The unfortunate part of that is, you know, today's in today's industry, I feel that even the apprenticeship isn't as valued as it once was, right? The yeah. apprenticeship is kind of useless. Like, I've got more people that I can do more work for and pay them less. Well, I'll tell you, I, I want to talk to you about your apprenticeship program, too, because yeah. it's very good. But uh, let's let's skip ahead from uh, working with Barbara Dan. And, yeah. and at what point did you decide to open your own shop? Yeah, so I did Barbara Dan's for a year. Then I And uh, it was just old. You know, it was an old man's shop, man. So I was doing, like, a number two all over and blocked off and tapered. And I wasn't getting enough of newer styles i wasn't getting longer lengths i wasn't getting a lot of straight razor shaves mm -hmm. so and i was the second i was the second chair right mm -hmm. i was the scotty pippen to his michael jordan so like scotty pippen like i want to see that i can do it on my own too man you know like who does it <laughs> that's, that's, that's every barber has aspirations to 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 for themselves to prove that they can do it and they can be the man too right? yeah you, so, you can't like, take nothing away from scotty okay. pippen though man no scottie no pippen. man that's my dude man <laughs> Pippen's my man so I went to the art of shaving. I went to the art of shaving for a year, and all I did was shave. Right. right. All I did was shave. And so it was at that point where I was like, um, you know, I became the barber. I became a barber initially so I could spend more time with my daughter, Jordan. At the time, she was five when I, when, I, when I got laid off. I was a single dad. Everything was driven about being able to pick her up, being available in her formidable year. So mm -hmm. working at Barber Dance and working at Art of Shaving, I, I had trouble with my schedule of getting off when I needed to get off for Jordan. Mm -hmm. So to the point where I was like, well, I might as well try to do it on my own because I had gone to Art of Shaving and it was back to being in a corporate situation, right? Like everything mm -hmm. was W-2s and what's your lunch breaks. And I felt that wasn't the reason I became a barber necessarily, right? So I said, like, maybe it's time for me to go out on my own. And while I'm green, I am green, but at least I have the business background and, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to know until you try. You got to take that leap of faith. And yeah. so I did it. You know, I've, I opened up a shop that was about an hour and a half away from where I live. Zero clientele. Um, I didn't even know anything about the block that I opened up the shop on, you know. Uh, it's an interesting I block, did, isn't it? There's been a whole lot of... Block, I mean, which I mean, back in the day in Berkeley, that, was a, that block was uh, strippers, drug dealers, gangbangers. And of course, it's, you know... A little bit and a gentleman's barbershop. <laughs> and now a gentleman's barbershop, you know. So... It was a perfect fit for the uh, for the uh, venue. You know what I mean? It, it looked oh, it great, and it's it and I think what's really interesting is the the graffiti style around there has changed uh, yeah. all the time. It's 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 hilarious. But but a, a really cute little shop that you opened up. Uh, I mean, I, setting the scene for people. Like when I walk into this shop, even when it was really just two chairs, was the first time I saw it. Um, man, there's there's usually Sinatra or something uh, of that kind of style playing, uh, you know, setting the, the tone. The, the wall is covered in black and white photos and, and interesting pieces of the history of masculinity. It smells, uh, you know, like a, it smells like fine aftershave when you walk in there. They're, the vibe is palpable. The guys are happy and up. And it's so charming when you walk in the place. It just feels instantly like home home Thank how you. did you do that um well you know when i was in you know having no clients being very green cutting hair you know i had to you know i had to go to a uh, to a statistic that i heard when i was in theory class at that point mature which is you know i'm thankful for that rub because it gave me the statistic that i heard that first week and they said in my moment of despair and discouragement feeling i was in the wrong i made the wrong choice because i didn't know how to do anything right 
uh, the theory teacher said our success in the industry is 70 to 75 percent personality on who we are as people, right? So the moment I heard, it was like Charlie Brown with like, wah, 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 and then I heard 70, 75 percent personality. I was like, oh man, I got this. Oh, this it's a wrap. It's game over. I got this. This. this this, and so I went back to what, what I know, what, what I embrace of the man that I have become at that age and who I am now on my island heritage, which is aloha, which is hospitality, which is neighborliness. It is welcoming people into your home. I said, I got that all day. So I said, well, okay, I may not know how to cut his hair real good, but I'm going to wow the crap out of you with this aloha and hugs and, and, and friendliness and fellowship and community. And so that's what I did. I drove home that part. And then I tried the haircut. Part, right? You know, I think what you tapped into there is incredibly important part of what we do. And I think it's the part that gets talked about the least, you know, because it is one of those things that uh, is one of the primary reasons why somebody decides to sit in your chair, not just like anybody's chair in that shop or not just anybody's chair, period, your chair. Yeah. They, they come back to you for you. Now, I, I think... Um, do you have advice that you can give people on things like that or, or, or things that you tell the guys coming into the shop that you think is the most valuable thing for them to know about that aspect of service? Like what, what is it that you share with these guys coming up and how have you developed such an awesome team of guys? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you for that, that compliment on the team and everything. Um, you know, what it comes down to me and what I look at it is, is that <laughs> there's so many, it's saturated now, Maddie, right? It's yeah. oversaturated right now with barbershops. Uh, we hit that resurgence and man, it just kept going and it hasn't stopped. The problem is it wasn't producing what I feel is quality shops. It was just producing a lot of shops. Yeah. So now it means that the average consumer has so much more options to choose from. Like anything else, like what, where to eat, go eat, you know, how many taco trucks can you go to? How many bars can you go to? How many different craft beers can you drink? So many more options. So how do you separate yourself from the next? And I don't honestly believe, well, I never discount or discredit the ability to be able to do good haircuts because we're as, as licensed professionals, we're supposed to be proficient at that. You can't even do that. I mean, you can do so much customer service and hugging and, you know, you can, the hug's going to go from hello to I'm sorry, man. I'm so sorry that I missed you. <laughs> well, you know what they say? Like, I remember, I remember early on, cause you, you opened a shop really early and, and yeah. uh, right, you know, not, not too long around when I opened my shop and stuff. So I look at a lot of those people that were doing it. You're one of the people caught my eye. Yeah. And, uh, and I think it's really funny. There wasn't a lot of us back then, you know, and then now there's just so many. So many. And so, somebody but told me this. How do you differentiate? yourself from the other guys on the block right how well, do you differentiate in terms of the service and the product that you're providing versus the next person i think it was really interesting to uh to look at statistics and 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 a lot of people's reaction to opening tons of shops was very negative oh man i was here first yeah. oh yeah. you know we had yeah, 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 i created yeah. then it's so all your thing yeah. i was like here's the thing you need to know 50 percent of shops out there are below average yeah. because that's just math yeah. All right. Like 50% of the shops that exist are below average. The more shops they open, the more below average shops there are. You only have to worry about whether or not you're one of them. Yeah. <laughs> you, you are not one of them. Then you're okay. And I, and when I opened up as a one chair shop, my whole thing, my philosophy was because I had my insecurities as a bar cutting hair on the cutting yeah. hair side. Right. Um, I had my insecurities in that area. I wasn't insecure about who, who I was as a person and what I could offer them service wise and personality wise. But there was that bigger part of it, like, well, I can only do so much of that. What about the part where they're coming to me for, right? Yeah. And what you find out, what I found out, and I found over, over the first two years while I was working by myself, in this little science experiment that I had created in this controlled environment, was that if you give them better service and you give them something where, you know, he, when they sit in our chair for the first time, Maddie, that's not the first time somebody's ever got a haircut, unless yeah. it's like baby's first haircut, you know? <laughs> So if you got if you got a grown ass man that's twenty plus or even sixteen plus that sits in your chair, he's had a haircut somewhere before. He's in your chair or in our chairs because there was something from the last one that disconnected them from that barber, mm -hmm. right? And maybe it was the quality of the haircut. You know, this could be a many a many things. Mm -hmm. But what I found over time was the lack of appreciation for that individual's time mm -hmm. and for that individual's money that they were paying. I, I'm, I think it's interesting you brought this up. I've been sharing this in a class. That I, I found some information on this one from 2017, where a, a few people did a research project around why they leave a barber or a stylist. Yeah. I, I always say that, you know, the reason that this is, you know, look at your new client with the understanding that that is somebody else's old client. 
yeah. right? And it can easily be your old client yeah. too, you know? And the reason why people leave a barber stylist, most people think it has to do with the haircut, but out of 10 things that they listed, that actually ranked number eight on level of importance. Number one was customer service. service actually, man. number one was boredom, actually. Sorry, number two was customer service. Boredom yeah. is a big yeah. thing, but I, I think that I think boredom comes down to disconnection and I think a lack of customer service. You know, very few people out there can tell you the difference between an eight out of ten haircut and a ten out of ten haircut. Yeah, we're not they're not trying to see it, right? They're not no. trained that we you know, we, we spend so much time or these younger barbers spend so much time trying to outdo the haircut that they see on social media or the guy sitting or the gal sitting next to them. You know, our eyes are trained to see those nuances. The customer who's already sitting about six feet away from the mirror, who grabs the mirror or is shown the mirror, he can't see them. Very nope. few, very few can tell those nuances. Yeah. If, you, if you get to a point, and I learned that, right? Like I would always show the mirror, mm -hmm. like when I, it was my time, it was early days, they're like, well, I, well I, bought the, I gave you every customer service thing I could give you and every personality, and here you go. And they're like, yeah, looks good. I'm like, come on, man, like, you know, look. <laughs> I did that I trick where you move the mirror like, around really fast. Yeah, yeah. You're like, there you go. See? Like, See? Like, <laughs> uh, but even now with guys that I've had for eight, nine years, 10 mm -hmm. years, I show them the mirror and they're like, oh man. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I've, and I've actually got better since I first, they first said about chair. So like, you want them to, to check, check it out. Can you, just see, can you just tell me if you just, you know, see any improvement? You know? This is my chance to show <laughs> up, man. Just don't rob me of that. But in a full shot, they're like, ah. It's not getting any better, but I'll try again next month. Like, appreciate you. God bless you for your patience. You know? Now, the, I mean, as, as far as a full shop goes, I mean, yeah. like, you're still in the same room. Uh, one of your shops, anyway, is still in the yeah. same room yeah. uh, that you started with just one chair in. And somehow you managed to turn that into four chairs in that shop. Yeah. And I mean, uh, it so, is like, yeah. it is snug. But you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't feel, uh, it feels cozy, but it doesn't feel crowded. You know what I mean? There's a, the vibe really carries that. And what I love about it is the way that when you're in that shop and I'm in, I'm in that shop with you guys, the banter that's happening is very inclusive, right? Very inclusive. Like I, I believe um, one of the things that I learned from you and you don't even know that I learned this from you, but uh, it, it's a thing that I learned from watching the way you guys work. And it's a theory that I, I've kind of developed and it's the, the economy of exclusivity is over inclusivity is what the thing is about now, especially as far as building community shops and stuff. Cause I go into your shop and I feel included and I see the, the customers feel included and I see a culture there. You know what I mean? How important is it to you to cultivate that? It's huge, man. It's uh, because the shops that when you open a shop, any barber that opens a shop, the shop becomes an extension of that person's or our individual personalities. Right? So, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna build and grow and succeed on 70 75 percent personality, then my shop or sh multiple shops may have them has to ha it has to show that it has to embrace that the, the customer walking in has to feel it from the moment they walk in. I have to be able to and then they talk about client experience. I have to be able to capture them from the moment they hit my website to the moment they sit in my chair, right? And it has to be consistent all the way through. If I lose them, if they walk into my shop after they hit the website, they hit the social media. They look at everything, then they walk in and they don't feel the inclusiveness. They don't feel the community. I speak a lot about fellowship, community, and family. If he doesn't feel that or she doesn't feel that when they walk in, what was it all for? I've lost, I've spent all this energy and I've got to disconnect and that's where the boredom comes from, right? That's where they're like, eh, it was cool, but it wasn't really my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. you know? And that may still be the case. You know, There is some uh, ex in inclusiveness, but the shops themselves project an exclusive, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, like it's, it's and when I was by myself back in the day, I used to say, "Well, I'm everybody's barber, but I'm not everybody's barber." Mm -hmm. right? I'll cut every, I'll cut anyone that wants to walk in as long as they appreciate my price point, the service I'm going to give them, and my personality. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might try it once and then never come back, but they'll never walk. They, my hope is that they never walk away and say that. Oh, that was a garbage experience, man. They might say, "Oh, that was a good experience, but haircut wasn't really my styling, whatever." And that's okay, as long as they don't leave saying like, "That was phony." Right. Yeah. It's all a facade. So. Yeah. I think that's an interesting thing. You've managed to strike that balance of exclusive and inclusive because with your yeah. culture, you're incredibly inclusive, but you yeah. remain at a fairly exclusive price point. What is your price point for your, for your haircuts and your, your, uh, your services? Sure. So we start, uh, the junior barbers start at 50 and then they go, they go all the way up to 150. Right. Yeah. Now that's a, that's in our industry. That's what most people consider to be quite a premium. Yeah. But yeah. the thing that people probably don't know is that to get to that point in your shop, 
what happens to those guys that are coming in? They don't just leave another shop and show up or they don't just start out of nowhere at $150 a haircut. No, 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 no. Yeah. So it's all in, it's all in growth, right? It's, it's, it's opportunities that are earned the same way Barbara Dan taught me, you know, he's from the generation that really were licensed. Their license did say master barber on it. Right. Yeah. It wasn't just a title kind of thrown out and just, it, how it is now self so he, self-declared self-declared self-proclaimed um you know he went through it and told me like the journey you had to go through not just in school but then you get your apprentice license then you go under a master barber for 18 months and you go back and take another test right mm -hmm. and the apprenticeship was hard it was almost harder than school right because mm -hmm. you have no experience but they teach you all that stuff mm -hmm. so when i came very green into the industry at 38 i'm 50 in a few months man you know, it, been, <laughs> you look, you look good, man. You look better I'm than in. me. Yeah, well, I, shoot. I've, you guy. and I, you and I, I have literally been, lighting, man. I got good house lighting. You and I, I have literally been watch. watching each other's beards <laughs> turn gray. <laughs> oh, man. But I, I, you know, I wasn't green in the industry in both cutting hair and a little bit in, on, on the savviness of owning a barbershop. So I made, I, I made very calculated steps to get to where I am today because I didn't have the time to make the mistakes that the younger cats are that, that I was going to school with that were coming into the industry that are like 16, 18, 20 plus, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so fortunately with my background in business, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna get to from, if I'm gonna separate myself from the pack, mm -hmm. then I can't afford to make a mistake. So calculate, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Price points went up as I, as I grew with a little bit more experience, I did a little bit of extra stuff. And even clients over time when I was a one chair shop said, raise your prices because now it's hard to get in. Just one, sh one chair, but I got to wait two months if I didn't book my appointment. Now that let's get into the advice on how you raise your prices, because I think a lot of people get stuck in, um, you know, I've been doing hair for this many years. I don't want to raise my prices. I'm going to lose yeah. all my clients. Uh, you know, tell, tell me, tell me the journey of that. How did that go for you and, and whatever advice you can share with our listeners for that? Yeah, sure, man. Uh, so when I first started haircuts at Barber Dance for $20, all right um he wasn't uh he wasn't a 30 minute haircut and go he, he was like still about 45 minutes because there was a lot of chat and dialogue going on so when i went from there to the art of shaving they were charging at that time their haircuts were 40 dollars. now to me in my mind i'm like man ain't nobody gonna pay no 40 dollars in this mall you know and then people come in and i and i well you know i didn't have to tell them the price you gotta go get rung up at the register and they just Rung them up, easy, forty dollars. Like, Dang, you know that mm -hmm. that 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 blew my mind that that jump in twenty dollars to me because a lot of us in our insecurities think I'm my value is not worth that jump. Sure. Right? What I realized. Would, would you that, say that it's because the guys are still valuing the haircut? Yeah, I mean, you know, like guys, it, for all intents and purposes, barbering and price points have been this all the yep. time. Yep. You know, everybody else has grown, cost of living has gone up everywhere else, but barbers have always felt like here because of. If I raise it by two dollars, he's gonna go in all the other shops on the street. He might go to this, right? Yep. So when I jumped to Art of Shaving and I looked and I paid attention to the aesthetic of the Art of Shaving, right? Mm -hmm. um, the decor of that store, right? So yeah, you, you you're walking in, you're talking about like uh, here. Let me get something for you real quick. Let me so I can do my please, little example. It's actually really funny they mentioned this because I, I went through a similar thing where I had guys when we first opened our shop, uh, I was trying to figure out what our price points were going to be. And I was looking at everybody uh, down the street that was charging $17, $18 for a haircut was the most expensive haircut we found in town. And I opened my doors at $35. Yeah. And I remember it was really funny, the reaction you get from people, you know, they look at it and they look around, they go, yeah, it's a nice looking yeah. shop. But, yeah. you know, one guy looks at the thing and he's like, ah, good luck with that business model. Model and he walks out the door, but he doesn't see that all the chairs are full of yeah. people. You know that there there is a market for every yeah. price point. Don't you agree? Well, that's the thing, right? So, so when I looked at that, I looked at the art of shaving, I looked at the decor, I looked at the price point jump. So when I opened, I said, "Well, I'm already working at a shop. I'm leaving a shop that I was being priced out at forty dollars for a haircut at a mm -hmm. minimum." Mm -hmm. So I basically mirrored their menu when I opened up my place because people were paying that. So. They should pay me for my space. And if I give them the same, if not, I'll give them a similar aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I'll give them the same appointment parameters, but I'll give them better service because I wasn't now confined to how the art of shaving wanted me to stay in this little box, right? Right. If I could be all of, all of who I was. Right? Well, that's the, that's the spirit of the entrepreneur, isn't it? it you is. know what I mean? It's, it is. it's, I, this is, this is a great way to do it, but I think my way is better and yeah. they, I'm going to prove it. Yeah. 
So the reason it grew is because, you know, the reason I went one shop or one chair is because I didn't want to manage anybody. I figured like if I could just do it my way, yep. you know, and it was, you know, it was good and until I got like too busy and I was spending a lot of time exerting my 70, 75% personality on brand new customers. Mm -hmm. Every time was a new customer. Mm -hmm. So if I started losing these guys that I started building the relationship with, I got to, I got to start over again. Right. It is tiring. The building, the building part is, is it, it, can, it can exude a lot of energy. Do you treat, uh, do you treat everybody, you know, are there varying degrees, I guess, that you're exerting with people? I mean, it is easier when you have an existing friend. And yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we want to say that, you know, my first client of the day and my last client of the day gets the same barber, yeah. but do they? Well, they get it all. They get the same. They get, they, everybody going to get a hug. I mean, I don't even know how it's going to be with no hugging now, but everybody going to get, <laughs> gonna get I, like an elbow hug or something. <laughs> man, <you know? laughs> oh, man. Um, how it, how, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Let's answer the question. Yeah. So, so like even with the price point thing, you know, one of my one good example to me is like, what are you giving more to justify the increase in your price? Yeah, you have to be busier, so then you're you you know, so you can your your price point will help separate those that are not tipping you, those that are always late, those who always got issues, right? It, it weeds out the ones that are not over time that you realize like these guys. I need to I need to weed these guys out, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't just keep raising your price without adding something extra or, or improving the quality, right? So my example was always that it was like these phones, right? So you got these old, yep, these the old flip phone. phones. Right? Oh, uh, you know, the old, man, that brings me back. I had. I, one wanted, I got some of these too. <laughs> <laughs> The slide out keyboard. I got I got these in the drawer with all the wires and the cables that I'll never use again. I don't even know what they go to, but it was like That's these, amazing. right? So like this phone was mm -hmm. a good phone. And then they came up with these ones where you could do more stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um and then you got now like the iPhones, yeah. the smartphones. So for all intents and purposes, this phone and this phone do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But now this thing has more benefits, right? Mm -hmm. Now you get the call and receive, text and receive, but now, now this is, nobody wants this because now you can get your music, you can get your ma maps, you can get your apps, you can get all, this, oh, is, but, what you aspire, this is what you aspire to be. Yeah, right? but that shit's expensive too. And so there you go in terms of raising your price. <laughs> yep, it's value. Want, it's value, right? So now if you look at the people that make these phones, like everyone's either hooked to your iPhone or your, your uh, Android. Mm. Every time the newest one comes out, everybody's willing to lose this one to get the new one. And this one just came out a year ago. Mm -hmm. So that's where you should, and as I look at it in other business models, like as a barber shop, as a brand, I want to be the iPhone of barbering. I want to yeah. be the yeah. Apple of barbering. I want to be, you know, like even a, 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 a Hyundai and a Lamborghini both do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Why is a guy buying the Lamborghini? Because it goes, they both go to A, B, and C but one gets there in a little bit more style, right? Yeah, so you want to, my price, my ideal is like, I don't want the customer when it comes to my haircuts to say, well, like if they're, if they're looking shopping, they want to go, well, that's nice. And they look at the price and they put it back down. Yeah. Mine is to go after the one that says like for that price, I see the value in that yeah. without even sitting in my chair. Yeah. It's weird too, because there's a perception to value uh, when there is a certain price point that is yeah. just unquestioned, right? You just don't question the value of a thing that costs over a certain amount of money. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. It just, it puts you in a market where that's just what you pay and that's okay. And I mean, I think a lot of this has to do with where you're situated too, doesn't it? I mean, oh, you're, no, you're, was, yeah. you're in the Bay area, right? Uh, the Bay area, lots of tech companies, lots of, you know, there's, it's a very expensive area to live. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that, that's probably going to play a, a bit of a role in your pricing structure as well, does it? It, it does, uh, but I still, even without that, like I got guys that, or the shop has guys that work at Apple, work at Twitter, work at all these places, but then you have the guys that they just, he, uh, he teaches music out of his house, yeah. you know? We got high school students that, we got even elementary school students that his mom will come and he'll pay for half, she'll pay for the other half. Yeah. Now you, you provide service for like an hour and it, it is really like a, a quite a, a, you know, a pampering service for guys, you know, there really is a, a desire to make them relax and, and right. enjoy themselves. Right. Um, the, the hour goes by quick. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it does it ever. They're done, they're like, oh shoot, done, you know, cause they're, they're, they've lost track of time. They've lost their, 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 like now we're in quarantine. All we think of is time. We look at the clock. We look at like, okay, how many more movies? Yeah. So in that place, there is no time when it comes to them, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the only place probably once a month that they can go where they don't have to think about anything else but themselves. And there's not a lot of places anymore where a man can self-indulge 
for himself because he's providing so much for everybody else and he has the burdens of the world the burdens of providing or even just the stress of being a man in today's whatever you know so to go into the shop like his phone's not getting answered his wife's not calling him or his husband's not calling him the kids are not trying to track him down his boss not trying to track him down and that's the, the, what price do you want to put on that yeah you know? yeah now i you and i opened shops for very similar reasons i was yeah. i was in a same situation where you know i was i was thinking about uh my grandfather's generation and that that classic masculinity uh yes. and and the role that the barbershop had played in that yeah. and and i know that you and i uh have kind of really early on bonded over that and you have a side project on instagram which is called yeah. the art of being a gentleman correct uh, uh do you want to tell us a little bit about that I just, yeah, real briefly, it was, you know, I realized that um, in the barbershop as, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a room food filled with like-minded men, where, where like-minded men, depending on, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it don't matter if you've been locked up before, it don't matter if you're a dad, if you're straight, gay, it don't matter, nobody knows you when you come in, right? You're just going to be treated as one of the guys. Mm -hmm. So where can you get that anywhere else, right? And where can like-minded men encourage, support, uh, uh, listen, uh, heal, grow? You know, when I, when I first, I think I told you this one, when I first opened up the shop, before I opened up the shop and my mom was here from American Samoa and we were just, I was decorating the shop and uh, she, she made sure to remind me like, well, because I grew up in the church, man, you know? So in Samoa, it's like this big on faith in God and, so my mom goes, uh, son, just don't forget uh, this is God shop. You just, you just his employee, you know, he said, this is going to be where the men come to heal and the, you want to be able to minister to them. You know, she said, remember where two or three are gathered in his name. There he is in the midst of them. I said, yeah, that's real deep mom, but can I put my name on the window? You know, <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know how God's barbershop in Berkeley is going to go over, but, but that seed that she planted really did. It, it reminded me of my, my, my roots, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it reminded me of, of like, this is where a guy's gonna come and, and as a barber, as a therapist, you just, it just, you just develop into that role. Yeah. So you have to mentor, you have to be a good example to them. So mm -hmm. when I started the art of being a gentleman, a lot of it was posts on what I felt or how I was raised on what a gentleman meant. And it didn't mean like how you dressed. It didn't mean like how, how side parted your hair was or whatever how polished your shoes was, it was your character, your integrity, right? It was yeah. the heart that made the man, it wasn't his clothes. So what I started doing was posting a lot about those values. Mm -hmm. And then I separated that out to see, well, this this probably what I thought was a need to just project this message. And there's a lot of gentlemen's pages out there, but sure. I started that and now it's got a decent little following, but we've built it out now uh, to, to be an actual company. Mm -hmm. uh, business partner now is his name is Max Lober. He owns uh, high definition barbershops here in uh, Moana Creek. Nice, uh, real, real, real intelligent young man. So we're now we've formed it. So we'll have uh, a nonprofit site where we go do uh, haircuts for the homeless. But we're going to oh, use awesome. barbering as the as the conduit to reach out to uh, uh, at risk youth mm -hmm. and let them know that you know barbering has helped me. It's helped this guy. It's helped all of us, and all of us come from different walks of life and have, have, have had our own transgressions, failures, ups and downs, but it's allowed us now to move forward in a more positive, uh, positive direction. I think my grandfather used to say that when you put a part in a man's hair and a shine on his shoes, he becomes his best self. Yeah, right. Oh, it, they, it's like the difference between a guy wearing a tracksuit and a guy wearing a tuxedo. Yeah. You know, the same guy yeah. wearing either of those things is going to carry himself very differently. Yeah. And I think that there's always been an element of of kind of that gentleman's quality masculinity in the barbershop. I think the barbershop yeah. has played a role in that throughout history. And uh, even though I think there's a lot of different avenues in which barbershops can start to take on personalities that are, are leaning towards that. Um, yours is very much about that. And, yeah, and it's and awesome think, to I see think, it. I think the down, the down would spiral though for a lot of barbering when it got uh, saturated the way that it did mm -hmm. was that the man coming in now that were running these barbershops and that were working in the barbershops. I mean, they, they went from masculine to bravado, right? Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Do you, do you notice a big, big difference in the, in the barbering scene in the last oh. couple of years? Because I've known you since before all the boom happened. Yeah. So what, what's it like for you down there? Like, how do, you, how do you see the industry right now? 
that's hard, man. Um, you know, the one plus that I do see about uh, this, these unfortunate circumstances that we're in is that it's going to weed out a lot of the folks that weren't in this for the right reason, right? You're talking uh, about the, the COVID-19 uh, yeah, lockdown yes, quarantine yes, right now, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's, when people jumped on this, it wasn't just, you know, individuals jumping in on, on, the, on the resurgence. It was like big companies, right? Yeah. Uh, but the, the message always seemed to be the same thing to me. It was that you had to be a man with the beard. You mm-hmm. had to be the guy with the with the nice pompadour side party here. You always had to have a very tailored fitted suit, right? Right. And so I think along came with that was like this is the definition of what a man is, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think you've mentioned it before about like in the earlier two thousands it was metrosexual, right? You, right. You do a class on this on and how we've kind of changed from that. Now it's like the lumberjack look or whatever. And those changes are gonna go there, go in terms of style. But what shouldn't change is like how a man I feel should act, right? Yep. So now the barbershops became super like big dudes, tattered beards, tattered to the neck. And so they felt because I have this, I got to act a certain way of this. Mm, right? the, and I got to be the tough guy. Because I got to be the tough guy because this is where all the, 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 the influencers were so there on Instagram are showing like a very, yo, 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 I'm, I'm mm-hmm. cool, I'm cool like that. I'm, I'm, I'm. So to the point where a customer will walk in and they don't even acknowledge the customer. Yeah. Right, like, I, it's, it's, I, like it's too it's too out of your way as a tough dude to say like hello sir how may i help you do you have an appointment with us or we, we can help you it's really just like the head nod or or not even acknowledge them at all i think that that really falls into the realm of like cultural exclusivity you know what i mean yeah. uh, when we talk about exclusivity versus inclusivity yeah. I, I feel like um that is just a form of exclusivity it's just people's yeah ego and coolness uh you know i think i think a lot of people when when that becomes so normal and when you're around those people all day long um forget how intimidating that can actually be to a customer from a customer standpoint yeah i mean i'm a you know we're about the same height man i'm a mm-hmm. six three i'm a two <coughs> two hundred and uh, <laughs> tell me the scales right now i'm not at fighting weight right now in case this quarantine thing got me out of not at fighting weight right now but you know when you come in i, I can be an intimidating looking guy right mm-hmm. Yeah, you're a big dude. Uh, I'm a big dude. You're Samoan, so, man. You're like yeah, you're, yeah. But I'm, you're I'm like, on the skinnier you're side. You're like Aquaman, <laughs> for God's sakes. <laughs> so slightly if shorter smile, hair. If I don't, if I don't smile, if I don't acknowledge you, if I don't make you feel welcome from Jump Street, mm. if I don't project that in my social media, then I'm no better than everybody else that feels like I got to project this. I got a beard, so I got to be this dude, right? Yeah. Like it, 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 the heart of a man, right? Because everyone that comes here is just. We all got the same hearts. We all got the same blood. Mm -hmm. They're just looking to belong somewhere. So what I think the problem with a lot of barbershops is that this exclusivity that they built for themselves, there's there's plenty of clientele there to eat. Everyone's going to eat, right? But they want their exclusivity just to bring in that, attract that customer, Mm -hmm. that clientele. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you treat everybody with love, respect, uh, humility, like that, that Mm -hmm. grows, man. Yeah. Right. And, so and I think more you can charge more people will come and appreciate it more and they won't feel out of place. They'll feel like they belong. I think what you've managed to do really well is build a culture of uh, your clientele, you yeah. know, is, is to build yeah. uh, a community of people, not just, um, you know, not just customers. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between customers and clients, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and I think uh, a lot of people work in shops where they get by on customers uh, and that's not helpful during a time like this when we're forced to close down. Uh, how, how are you doing and how has your client community uh backed you up have, have you noticed a, a, a swell of support from your community oh 100 percent. talk about yeah, it yeah i think it's you know once you get into and you know i'm very big on the relationship building right like if you're not building relationships with the client for the moment the first client that sits in your chair if you're not out to build a relationship with that person by the time they leave you failed your job right i tell my team that like a like a football team you know you're running the ball you run the ball for small inches little inch by inch by inch all to set up the big pass right so mm-hmm. The same thing is what I have in that hour. Like I'm just trying to run the ball, man. I'm trying to I'm trying to open up a conversation. I'm trying to listen. And when I see that opening, I'm going, man. I'm either running it or I'm throwing it. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's that that opening that I can build. Like I can connect to this person to make him feel like I am genuinely here for him. Mm-hmm. So over the years, as you build this with every customer and you make this your culture, when times like this where your shops are down, like these customers or these friends now will reach out and want to somehow prepay for haircuts. They'll ask like, what can we do? 
Uh, do we need anything? How are you doing? Uh, and it's been overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, what I've reached out and I've told my team to, when they reach out asking to prepay for haircuts, politely let them know thank you, but politely decline. Wow. Politely decline and let them know that the support that, that we look for them is just to be back in our chairs when we open again. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's a different approach, right? It's a different approach to everybody what, else, to be honest, else, everybody oh, else yeah. who's begging yeah. for help right now. And, yeah, and, no, and rightfully yeah. so, I, I understand why people are, it's a scary time for a lot of people it, it, uh, you know, in our so industry. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, Maddie, I'm, uh, I'm like one of those people that uh, is probably on the other side of the coin from what everybody else is doing, right? Because, and I've explained to my guys, like, I'm not going to ask the, or expect our customers to support us when we're down because they've yeah. been supporting us when we were open, right? Yeah. So all the money that they have paid us from the first time they sat with us, that's money that we should have saved to prepare yeah. us for times like this, right? So I think when I said earlier about this will weed out a lot of the people that aren't serious because it's no, we, you know, as barbers, we're notorious for not budgeting, not saving, overspending, not living within our means, right? Mm -hmm. We made some money, it's in our pocket. I don't even know how much I made. I know I'm, I can guesstimate I made a lot, right? So I had someone reach out to me asking, what can I do to help the Bay Area community of hair stylists and barbers to get through this? And I said, I can empathize with everybody, but I don't know the necessity that I sympathize with everybody because everybody in the Bay Area that does hair is making at least 60,000 plus a year. Okay. Okay. 60,000 plus a year that nobody, majority are not paying taxes on, not claiming and not saving. Mm -hmm. So how can we hit a situation like this where you don't have a rainy day fund set aside for yourself? Yeah. Cause right. brother, it is raining. It's storming. Yeah. I see Noah, I see Noah's art just go by a couple days ago, man. Shoot. Sure. I said, have you seen the pigeon yeah. yet, man? Brother, have you seen it? <laughs> is the pigeon back yet or what, man? You know? but I, think, I think it is interesting, though, because, I mean, part of what has happened is you built such a strong relationship and such a strong community, and there is a safety in that. There's an insurance there. there and, is, I mean, it's not intentional, but yeah. there, is, there is that to draw on. But, um, but you, it yeah, seems yeah. to me like you, um, you are too proud to get that help. Or, or to take that help. Is, I mean, it, is there something in there? No, I think it's, it's, um, I think it's my respect for, for, for the community of customers that support mm. us. Mm -hmm. But everybody's in a pinch right now, right? Yeah. Maddie? Everybody, this, we don't know of the guys that are reaching out to us. We don't know if their budget is, has, has some variance for paying the barber while he's not getting his hair cut. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, you know, what I think the problem with the education system right now in the barber schools is that, um, they don't focus on stuff like this. Like you know? business stuff. They, like... don't, they don't focus on the business side of barbering. And yeah, yet agreed. all of us get licensed become self-employed individuals. So we are running now our own businesses, whether you work at a shop like yours or mine. Yeah, or with little, little to no training. With little to no training, right? So it's like the NBA players or the, or, or the NFL players that go in and make millions and millions of dollars, but don't know what to do with that money. Mm. Come three years out, they're broke. They got on the show for it and a lot of debt. So it's the same thing with our industry. you know. So I feel that the, the schools themselves are doing a disservice because we're not focusing. You know, it's like professionalism, the history of barbering, all this mm -hmm. chemical stuff, and then at the end, how to be a professional, yeah. right? And, yeah. and that should be- it's like how to, how to look the part, basically. Yeah. So that, but that should be it. being yeah. carried through all the way through, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping that, and I don't mean this to, to I, I say it with all love and compassion for, for, for my colleagues that are out there struggling and suffering, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm only in the position that I'm in because I went through that, that recession in 2008 and mm -hmm. I've been in that, I've been in the shoes that they're in now. Right. Mm -hmm. So all I've done as a barber since I first started barber dance is save. Mm -hmm. I have saved and I have saved and I have saved that I've lived within my means well below my means. Right. I'm a frugal dude, man. Like everything I'm wearing is from a, a thrift store. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm willing to pay for things that I enjoy, like a good bourbon, right? yeah, yeah, sir. Like a prime rib. Right, a good cup of coffee, man. Not the shitty coffee you be drinking on the road, man. No, no. You this know? is actually the best part of the lockdown is every day I have there a great go, cup of coffee. That's every it. day. That's it's it's amazing, it. actually. I'm, so, I'm getting so spoiled man, now. Yeah, so as customers, our customers, you have to think when it comes to price point, like, 
not every dude can afford the hundred dollars. Nobody, not everybody can afford to pay me $150 plus gratuity for a haircut. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know what their budgets are, but the fact that they come, I got to appreciate the fact that he's paying me whatever if he's paying my apprentices that are on apprenticeship program, just getting gratuities. Mm -hmm. If it's the $50 guy, if the 65, 100, 150, we have to appreciate that in the moment that it happens, not yeah. after it's now, after we're, we're in these moments of, of strife and struggle to say like, bro, I know you paid me a lot of money, mm -hmm. but like, I need you to give me some more money because yeah. I'm not working. They see, so well, I'm not working too. Yeah. And that's why my mentality is I would much rather support of our clientele base when we come back because we're going to come back. Oh yeah. Huge. We're going to come back, man. Huge. We might have to make some sacrifices to, and to cut the fat off the budgets in order for that to happen. But I won't put it on. I won't put my burdens and make those the burdens of and, my customers. I mean, on that's very admirable because there are considerable burdens right now. I mean, yeah. right before all of this happened, you just expanded out within the last year. You expanded out, uh, you know, two new shops. New shops, yeah. And and uh, to the people that are listening, one of the things that I think is really important to know is that when you own a company or you own multiple shops or a, you know the, a larger company or mid level company like mine, um, you you aren't insulated from this thing. Uh, you're in fact maybe a little more exposed because when when you first start out your thing, there's this risk phase that you assess or assume, right? You, all the money gets paid out, all the debt gets taken on. I sign my name to it, promising to pay for this, yeah. and and all of the risk of it not working out and all those things you know it's all there you know you own it you own all of it and all of your money that you're making off of anything is going into servicing that and then when uh you know near the end of its life or closer to the end of its life you get into the reward phase when everything's paid off and it starts generating income right but when you expand that's out like years that's not usually a few years out before you start no. seeing return on that on that one. yeah 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 it, it's usually not right away at all and so i mean you're knee deep in risk phase right before this thing happened you know what i mean so i mean when you when you're saying this you're not coming at it from a from a, a guy who's you know just going home at night and rolling around on a big bed of money because i know it's no, not no, you no, no. I, 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 and, and don't let that don't let anyone listening or watching this assume that i'm like uh uh, what's his name? Scrooge that that dives into his uh, vault. First <laughs> yeah. of all, I ain't got no vault. Okay. <laughs> but second of all, I ain't got no money in a vault like that. But I have enough where I have an insulation for, to protect me from this. Now, yes, I did uh, extend to a second location, mm -hmm. right? And now the third one that I committed to taking over. But as a business person, I don't. Uh, you remember what you watched that movie Heat, the old school movie Heat? Of course. Okay, so you remember the coffee shop scene, right? With De Niro and Pacino. Oh, talking to one another. What a scene. What a great okay, so that scene, scene that is. I, I, live by, I kind of live by that scene, right? I live by De Niro saying that I don't, if you can't leave something in 30 seconds, uh, don't get it too attached to something that you can't leave in 30 seconds or more when the heat drops, right? Mm -hmm. So in my mind, like I'm uh, at 50, I don't get attached to a lot of things very mental attachment to a lot of things outside of my family and my children mm -hmm. so i'm okay with closing a location that's mm -hmm. no that's that's okay for me right mm -hmm. uh, because i can say that i opened a second location so i can cross it off my bucket list and say look i did it mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have an ego or pride to say like i gotta hold on to this bad boy and when yeah. i know i'm just gonna this is gonna be a, an anchor that's gonna drop me lower so people i think there has to be in times like these you have to be prepared to do things that other people are not prepared to do right mm -hmm. And you have to be able to do it with some composure and you have to be able to do it with dignity and some pride. Mm. And so a lot of what I'm doing to say to the customers, I love you and thank you. The gesture of offering is beyond what I would ever could have imagined you would do, but no, thank you right? for these reasons. Well, I'll keep the business open. You just come when, it, when we could get the okay to, to come back cut hair. Well, I think that is the very definition of integrity. If you ask me and I, I applaud you for that. I feel the same. I, um, I, our our initial reaction was not to try and get help, but was to help. Yeah. Um, you know, I I recognize that I I would be given a, a very generous platform, yeah. and I have a lot of great friends, yeah. and uh, and I wanted to do something immediate to help them, and that was really our response. And and I'm in the same boat. I'm uh, I'm not looking for help from anyone. Well, I um, admire I, you gone beyond to even help our people in our industry through the the incentive programs that you've set up through your. For you, through your amazing product line, which is, you know, I, I would love to have seen a lot more of the today's uh, influencers, so to speak, kind of project a lot more positivity and, and sensitivity and help, not saying like, 
you know, we're all in this together. Yeah, we are, but can you can you use your platform to give some positivity out so that these guys can feel like we're in it together? But if he's if he's if he's positive, I'll be positive. You know, yeah. he thinks we gotta get out of it. Then it's like Mel Gibson and the Patriot, bro. Like when Mel Gibson was running with the flag, like hold the line, hold the line. Like I've <laughs> seen already, but you and a few others running with hold the line. Everybody else is like retreating. You know, I just saw a real lack of leadership. There's a f- there's a few people stepping up and saying, look, here's what we have to do, and and I'm gonna do it with you. Uh, everyone was saying, do this, or we're gonna publicly shame you, uh, or or make you feel terrible about, or you know, like. It, it was really a bad reaction from a lot of people, I think. And so for us, it was about like, look, how do we get in the boat with you through that? Like you yep. say, it's it's storming out, man. How are we going to climb yep. in the boat with you, whether this out together? Um, you have got an exceptional group of guys working with you. Uh, every time I meet new ones, I always know I'm going to like them before I even come down. Uh, because if you like them, but th- that just speaks volumes. Some of the guys that work in your shop are, yep. are people I consider to be uh, real good pals at this point. And when they start working there, they work for tip money, right? Yeah. I mean, so this is part of your apprenticeship. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I, you know, everyone comes in, they got to have a license. Um, but what I felt was like, if I'm going to have, um, my goal as the owner of the shop is to minimize the amount of mistakes these younger guys will make in their careers, right? Mm. If I can get them from school to the first day I opened and minimize the the lessons learned and the mistakes. And, you know, I had the savvy and, and, the, and the mindset to, to, to calculate my risks, right? I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm very risk adverse, man. So I'm like, I plan, I plan, not, then, I'll, then I'll make my faith move. Mm-hmm. But these the younger guys were like, I don't know, I just go cut hair and I'll make some money. So I want the new generation to say like, look, we're gonna show you how to do it right. I'm gonna show you how to manage your money. I'm gonna show you how to keep track of your books. I'm gonna show you my, the culture of the shop. I'm going to show you how to, my technique, my blueprint for doing haircuts. So everything kind of stays consistent throughout. And so that, in my mind, was what a true apprenticeship used to be before. So the orientation or the initial come into our shop is, and what you have to buy into is that you're going to have about a month or so, depending on your, how well you can, you can make the adjustment to come in. You're just going to work for free. You're going to work for tips. I'm not going to take anything from you. I'm going to give you my knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. And I'll give you my time. Mm-hmm. And I will help build your clientele. I'll give you enough through this apprenticeship program so that once you're off the apprenticeship, you're, you're making good money, right? And most of them are making good money through the, the tips because mm-hmm. the clientele base and the price points makes the very generous people. And they like to see and support the growth. Mm-hmm. Right? So when, you can, when they come and say, oh, it's our new apprentice, like, oh, that's so cool, man, and welcome aboard, and they, they make them feel welcomed into the family. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's their shop. To, it's their they're, shop welcoming, yeah. they're welcoming. And, I, and I make sure I let everybody know, like, oh, this, uh, make sure you know this is the OG right here. Dude, the, first, the, day that, the day that the day that the several days I guess that I've worked yeah. in your shop, yeah. every single one of the guys that sits yeah. in my chair is an OG. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this, this is my guy, you got to know this guy, and and I, I got to be honest with you, they have a lot of them stayed in touch with me over the yeah. years. Oh yeah, man. I reached out on the gram and cool. stuff, and been it's yeah. it's it's fantastic, absolutely. I'll sit in my chair and I'll be like, don't don't ask for that Matty Conrad haircut you got like three years ago, bro. <laughs> don't even. Don't show me no Matty Conrad pictures. I seen his recent <laughs> post, man. I don't need to see the. I don't need to see all that, man. Uh, I can't tell you how surreal it is that that's yeah. the case that people would even consider doing that. But, but that, that's um, what the barbershop is supposed to be, right, Matty? Yeah. Like, it, growing up, I always understood the barbershop to be it's the neighborhood. Uh, it's the neighborhood country club. Yeah. Right? Now you talk about exclusivity. Like not all of us that that and and and, and where we are in our economic life and the money mm-hmm. we make we can't all belong to a country club mm-hmm. you know i can't go have brunch at a country club and go, yeah, i don't belong yeah. to one not to say that that's any less or better but like a lot of us can't afford that kind of exclusivity in our mm-hmm. lives right uh we might have a favorite bar we might have a favorite restaurant so now guys can come into the barbershop and get a taste of what that's like man, yeah, i think know? there's a desire to belong you belong. know what i mean and, and i think that when it comes down to the barbershop and that classic masculinity yeah. that we we're talking about before yeah. i think that's always been a bit of a bastion of that in the community and i think guys want to feel a sense of belonging you know, to that, uh, and not just to the, not just to the physical place, but to the concept of it, to the culture around it, the community of it, you know, the, the, the affirmation that, that you get from positive influences in the community you know, of being around other guys that, that aspire to be better than they are all the time. You know, I think that there's something really to that. Yeah. I don't know where anywhere else we can go just kind of 
you know, shoot the shit, have mm-hmm. a drink, listen to some good tunes, listen to some dad jokes. <laughs> you know, just, yeah. now, now, you've got our new shop, uh, and your new shop is a bit of a different feel to it. And, yeah. uh, and uh, I remember the last time I was down there, you showed it to me. Um, tell me all about your new shop uh, and, and the vibe that you decided to go for. Yeah, so when I opened up the Berkeley one, my original shop, uh, you know, that's what barbering, that's what barbering at that time looked like to me in the big picture of it, right? Um, that's what I saw growing up. And so as it progressed, uh, and as more shops opened over time, like they were started, you know, like yours. I've seen on your your keep keep it handsome. Mm-hmm. I, I've seen that shown all over the internet, and that came from you, right? And so yeah. now you become one of those shops that becomes the the blueprint for other shops to 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 mirror out of admiration, right? Yeah, um, that's that's it's humbling. So I've, I've tried to take it as that over the years. It, at yeah, first, no, I, hard, at first, I was a little like. <laughs> What? No, oh, no, yeah, no. But, uh, but now I've yeah. kind of I've, I've chilled out about it. I'm like, yeah, I, I, know, I, have, I have my moments like that too. Man. It's flattering. But, but like over time, like I, my idea of barbering has changed, and it's changed because I've understood more about my 70, 75 percent personality and where that comes from. And it comes yeah. from my heritage. It comes from growing up in Samoa. Mm-hmm. It comes from being born in New Zealand. It comes from going to college in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. It comes from my island roots. So this new shop was going to be an homage to that, right? It was going to be you're going to walk in there and you're going to feel like you were in the South Pacific, man, you know, so. Um, you and know, you do, clients, you really do. Yeah. I mean, it's well, a beautiful shop. Walked, yeah, when I first opened, one of my clients from Berkeley came and he goes, well, you ain't, it's very Polynesian, man. And I, said, <laughs> I said, what does that mean, man? That could be like four dudes at a Raider gate, four Samoan dudes at a Raider gate, man. That could, <laughs> that's Polynesian, man, you know? So he said, no, it's very like uh, uh, mid-century-ish. Like I was in a, in a, in a high-end hotel, in Waikiki in a barbershop in there. And that's what I was aspiring for. Man. Yeah. I was aspiring for that that uh, Hawaii Five O with McGarrett and, and Dano. Yeah, to uh, me it looks Lord. very yeah. kind of like nineteen sixties kind of vibe yeah. to it. You that's know what, what I, I mean? What, very what, cool. I'm, I've never been to Cuba or Miami, but whatever those a barbershop in that era would have looked like is what I wanted is what I aspired for. I think you nailed it. What kind of music do you play in there? Same thing? Uh, a little bit of the same thing, you know, uh, some island music and mix it in with some Sinatras and, uh, you know, uh, Motown. And yeah, Elvis' Blue Christmas, Christmas and all that yeah, stuff yeah, over and over. The Hawaiian music yeah, in the background yeah. and stuff. I yeah. think that's awesome. Yeah, yeah that's uh, great. You know, like even now, you know, we talk about um, how this, this COVID-19 and coronavirus and how it affects our businesses. Like I have, I love that shot because mm. that shop very speaks to my heart, right? Mm. But I'm not opposed to closing that shop if I had to close that shop mm-hmm. because reality is, is, is the livelihood and where can you get that livelihood from? And I can still have my other shop, Berkeley. Mm-hmm. That's the bread and butter, right? Mm-hmm. And with the, with the new one, the Hawaii, the island shop was like, I was able to cross, I, my buck list was like, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And I did it. And mm-hmm. I can walk away with price saying like, I did it, you know? Yeah. So that's what I think people that are now faced with the situation, like what are you willing to, where are you willing to trim the fat off of your budget to get through this? Cause this could push all the way to August. Yeah. The reality is, you know, that's what they say. So are you, are you, are you digging your, your trench and your foxhole to get you through what was our, our band of brothers? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. man. In the winter in the snow, man, like we, we watched that at your house when I was the big guest party, man. Like I remember that, that you just got to dig in, man. Yeah, you know, this is a thing. So when, when uh, Mark Jason came up and, and uh, did a, a guest spot with us, and there's a video of that somewhere we did an interview. With, i got to dig that up. It's somewhere in there. And, uh, and he did a guest spot with us, which was just fantastic. And he came and stayed with us. I introduced him to Band of Brothers, which is my favorite documentary series of oh, all time. Okay. Well, it's not a documentary, I guess. It's just a 10-part okay. miniseries. Yeah. But it's yeah. the best one ever right. made. And I introduced him to it, and we sat and drank whiskey together. And I, that night, we became brothers, too. You well, know I what I mean? Like, like, I think I was there for like two or three days, man. Yep. All we did after work was go to your house, eat leftovers, drink yep. coffee, whiskey. Eat bourbon and watch Bad Brothers, man. I was like, this is my Uso, man. Yeah, honestly, it and was. Uso is like, 
<laughs> and and we've been best like really close friends ever yeah, since, yeah, man. Right? You've you've oh, uh, you've awesome, been man. a person in my life that I greatly value, and and I, I appreciate your friendship and your brotherhood over the years. And I I love seeing the stuff that you post. I I hugely respect it, and I think that the voice that you have in the industry right now, uh, the importance of that voice, it just can't be overstated. I, I think from from the old school community of barbers, um, there is I've never heard a, anybody that doesn't uh, as soon as they know that we know each other go like oh my god i follow that guy i love that guy and it's like right away i get such a positive reaction from you so um do you have uh, any departing words of wisdom you'd like to share with anybody today or or at least at very least tell people where they can find you and follow up to to get to know you a bit better i don't know i think if anything I want to part with man it's like you know you introduced me as like a a, a champion for traditional barbering right and if i could share a quick story my mentor barber dan you know, he's been there for 52 years as of this year. He had another guy that was working part-time with him. His name was uh, was Larry. Okay, he was at it. They both started barbering at the same time. So when I would go visit the shop just to fellowship and check on the old man, they would they were in there just ex- with no clients sitting there just exchanging battle stories, right? And I talk about how they had the grand life when they were younger. They had the house with the pool. And Barbara Dad was like, I had a Porsche in the driveway and all this stuff. And then... And I'm standing there just listening to all the battle stories. And then, they, and then the other guy was like, well, I'll tell you what, MJ, that's a good thing about barbers, man. We can cut hair till we die. I was like, yeah, that's what barbers that haven't saved any money have to have to save, man. Because I ain't trying to cut hair till I die, man. Like, I got an exit strategy. So I share that story to say now in these times of the, of the, of, of the, the closures, and these times of quarantine, it's like, I want everybody out there to start thinking better business. Don't think about how the OGs used to do it. You can be a traditional barber with better business savvy. There's a lot of resources out there on how to budget. There's a lot of resources out there, podcasts and books and, and YouTube videos on how to be a better business person. Because going forward, there's a possibility that we'll hit this again, man. Mm. There's, there's a recession it's, it's, come. It's, it's likely yeah. that it's going to happen yeah it's going to happen and this is going to get this is going to only go on longer more than likely it's going to go on so use this downtime don't be discouraged don't be don't be in worry don't be in depression use this time to educate yourself on how to do better business when you reopen okay mm. be willing to trim the fat off of your budget so that you are digging your foxhole man and your trench be in this, in this for the long haul not just for the quarantine but being barbering for the long haul because if you're not prepared now, during this moment that we're faced right now, how is barbering going to survive? Because this is this this I've seen a lot of prominent shops here in the Bay Area, man, are starting to close down mm-hmm. because they can't afford the rent and the landlords are not adjusting. So, if you're fortunate to make to get out of this as a barbershop owner or as a barber in general, you still have places to work, if not the shop right now, but somewhere. Do better business, man. Do better business so you're not faced with this again. Be prepared. Yeah. yeah, and I feel for everybody, man. And hopefully, nobody walks away from this podcast thinking like, "This is an asshole, man. This dude over here drinking whiskey, talking to Maddie Conrad." I I say it with the utmost humility to say, just I was fortunate to be where I'm at now, not because I've got these multiple shops. Like I was ready for this when I opened up one chair shop. Yeah, you know, I was yeah. ready for this because I had saved, and that that was it. And because the lifestyle I live, I don't live about outside of my means. And I, I think, think it's, it's important to know that. I think uh, having come through it before getting into barbering and now going through it again, I think that's just wisdom of experience talking. You that's know, fifty and I, years old, man. That's, that's I appreciate it, old, brother. You know, I appreciate yeah. it for one. As yeah. somebody that's gone through this, has seen it before, and came out the other side winning. Yeah. Um, absolutely love you brother like love love your shop love everything it stands for love all the guys yeah. there give, yeah. give them all my love and I will, uh, man. and i appreciate what you do for the industry bro i appreciate what you do as a human being man i love you for for being a brother a uso as someone could call you've been a uso now for many years man people always ask me what that means because i write that on your posts Us, yeah. and you just, <laughs> yeah. people are like what's his name yuki i'm like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. it just means my brother man yeah 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 so, you're thank you, thank right you back at you my dude now yeah. tell tell the nice people where they can find you uh i mean i'm out there man just type my initials mj Slofa. something will pop up uh, uh you know i'm not big on the following stuff man organically you'll find me one way or another uh, I'm sure Maddie will have a link when he posts this. So I'll be yeah, it's already there. Follow. It's right yeah. below you right now as oh, we're okay. talking. <laughs> but yeah. everybody, uh, I, I was worried this was going to be like when you teach your parents how to Skype for the first time, man. I thought <laughs> <it> was, 
<laughs> it is a little bit. Yeah. Somebody's going to walk in here in a minute, scratch in a robe, scratching yeah. them balls. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. All right, you guys, this has been a, a really great conversation with Mark Jason Salofa. Please go follow him on Instagram at MJ Salofa men's grooming. And I will be seeing you guys next week again for an exciting, well, an exciting and more conversations from <laughs> season two of whiskey tango Foxtrot. I can't believe they gave me another one. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you yeah, next week. Take care. Everybody be safe. All right. Bye-bye.